Welcome to Lunchtime Nerd. I'm Matt Holman, and I'm talking about today's topic, which is five indie comics to make into a streaming series. Uh, and so I'm, I'm real into indie comics. Um, I know that really makes me sound like even more of a hipster. Um, and as you can see, I've got a fedora in the background, so that's probably not going to bode well for my lack of hipster cred. Uh, but I'm a real big fan of a lot of independent comics. So this is not from comic books from uh, DC or Marvel. This is comic books from a company like uh, Wildstorm, which is barely around anymore. Uh, so that's a bad example. Dark Horse, um, who uh, publishes a lot of the old Star Wars comics, which a lot of people know him for. Uh, Image is a super big one. Vertigo is another one, which is actually from DC. It's, it's a DC imprint is what it's called. Uh, and there's other smaller companies like Ahoy uh, that's really great. Um, Black Mask is another one. Basically small independent comic distributors that are going and putting out work and things like that. Uh, and there's actually been this weird uh, resurgence recently of a lot of streaming series being based off of some of these independent comics. If you've seen the Umbrella Academy, the Umbrella Academy uh, is based off of a comic book by Gerard Way and drawn by one of my favorite, favorite uh, comic book artists, a guy named Gabriel Ba. Uh, and Gerard Way, of course, of My Chemical Romance. If anyone out there knows My Chemical Romance, I assume this is the point where you're going to start singing along. Uh, and they actually created the Umbrella Academy, which is now incredibly popular, you know, on Netflix with Ellen Page and all these other actors. Uh, the end of the, uh, I don't want to, oh, if I can cuss on this. So let's just say the end of the effing world, which is another Netflix one, uh, which is based off a comic book created by Charles Forsman, uh, who was actually here in Hampton Roads at a comic book convention uh, last year, weirdly enough. Then there's also The Boys, which is based off of um, a work by Garth Ennis and Derek Robinson. Oh, don't even get me started about Garth Ennis. That's not a good thing. I don't. I do not like Garth Ennis. Garth, if if you somehow have heard this, please don't take it personally. I like a lot of your work, but some of it, I just want to like bash my head into the wall. Uh, the Boys is not one of them. The Boys is a really great show, and in my opinion, probably one of his best comic books as well. So what you keep seeing is companies like Amazon and Netflix coming back to that well of indie comics. And I like to look and say, well, why is that? And the reason I think that is, is because these indie comics, they have such rich and varied worlds that are still a lot of times based in sci-fi and uh, superhero and fantasy tropes that a lot of people are aware of. And so what these indie comics tend to do a lot of times is they put a unique spin on it or they take a look at it from a different perspective. And the best thing about indie comics, in my opinion, is that they end. So Batman's been going since 1938. And, you know, every couple of years they'll go and revamp Batman. But in the end, his story never ends. He is still Bruce Wayne. He is still the Dark Knight. He's still, you know, swinging across Gotham City, that doesn't change no matter how much uh, a writer or artist may want to change some things. That essential core of what makes Batman never ends. The nice thing about indie comics is they end. Sometimes they run for 12 issues. Sometimes they run for 100 issues. But what happens is they end. And that's why I think streaming keeps coming back to indie comics for this. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put forth my top five indie comics to make a streaming series. Okay. So number five, Ex Machina. Um, actually, I have an Ex Machina poster thing right there. There? There we go. So you can see the corner there. This is one of my favorite comics. Um, it's written by Brian K. Vaughn and uh, drawn by Tony Harris. And the great thing about Ex Machina, it's this really neat concept where a superhero, uh, the great machine, runs for the mayor of New York City and wins. And what it balances really well is it balances a lot of the fun political stuff 
Uh, so, you know, you get a lot of trying to solve issues and there's crises happening and things like that. But you also get a lot of the great machine, um, a.k.a. Mitchell Hundred is his name, is trying to figure out how he got these powers. It was an accident. He found some mysterious artifact and it balances really well the normal political intrigue of something like the West Wing, for instance, where you've got uh, you've got garbage men on strike and them trying to figure it out. You've got this really cool cast of characters that all these advisors that surround him and things like that. But it also balances the mystery of where did the great machines powers come from? Uh, and I'm not going to spoil anything, obviously, but you do get a satisfying answer to that question as well as a really great political story. So number five for me is going to be Ex Machina. Number four, Lazarus. So Lazarus is created uh, by Greg Rucka and Michael Lark, who does the artist. Uh, Greg Rucka is a really well-known mainstream comic writer. He's written uh, Wonder Woman and a lot of other characters. He's one of those guys that's known for writing strong female characters, which, you know, in this day and age, we should have women writing strong female characters. But that's for my other top five list, which is top five women comic creators. We'll come to that later. Anyway, uh, so Lazarus is this really uh, cool story. And basically, it's a sci-fi uh, dystopian future where the world has been divided between 16 rival families. So each of these families, they have a, um, like a head bodyguard enforcer, which is called a Lazarus, that usually has some kind of superhuman powers. And this one focuses on the Lazarus for the Carlisle family, who is this uh, girl named Forever, who basically, she's called that because she can't die. She goes, she gets killed, she heals, she comes back, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and she's got this big um, secret in her past, and she's trying to figure it out. Now, the cool thing that Lazarus does, um, I've actually heard some people say that it's a little bit slow, is because it invests a lot of time in building the world. So what Greg Rucka did is, beside writing the comic book, he even has these, like, source books um, for each of the different families and explaining the timeline of how we get from modern day to this dystopian future. And one of the cool things about that is it's so rich and there's so many stories that you can tell and so many characters inside of this world. The nice thing is this. It reminds me a lot of something like uh, Game of Thrones. Where with Game of Thrones, you have this political intrigue, you've got all these characters, you've got all of this really meaty world building stuff that you can invest in. And Lazarus really kind of ticks off a lot of boxes there. Beside the fact that you've got families ruling the world, you know, it's kind of like medieval times and all of that. Uh, and so it's a really, really neat uh, comic book and I could definitely see that um, for fans of Game of Thrones The Walking Dead as well even though there's not zombies per se now there are people coming back to life and stuff like that uh, the cool thing um, about Walking Dead is you know you have this rotating cast of characters and there's this idea that no one is safe blah 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 uh, with Lazarus there is definitely that there's a lot of surprise deaths um, big twists a lot of intrigue and people backstabbing and all of this, uh, plus some really cool fight scenes. I, did, I forgot to mention, everyone fights with swords. The Lazarus all fight with swords, so there's a lot of really cool sword fighting in uh, that one. So that is my number four, Lazarus. Okay, number three is Incognito, uh, which is created by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. I could do a whole episode just on Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. They are like by two favorite comic book creators that are working right now. And what they do is they really write this like cool um, film noir kind of infused stuff. Uh, so they have another book called Criminal, which is all uh, about you know the seedy underbelly of this city and crime. And they've got another book called The Fade Out, which is all about um, old Hollywood and a murder that happens. Uh, but this one, I picked this one because one, there's never been a better time for superhero media than right now. And Incognito is a really cool one because it deals with a supervillain that gets put into witness protection. And how does he deal with that? So uh, it's really cool because of that, there's um, an accessibility 
to it where even if you're not crazy about the film noir kind of elements of a lot of their stuff, uh, there is that thing you can latch on to of superheroes, supervillains, people, you know, doing that. So it re- when I had to pick like a show that kind of reminded me of, uh, this one was a little harder. The Wire is what I would say. Like if you like The Wire, you would probably like an incognito adaptation because there is a lot of this double crossing and a lot of this two-faced and a lot of this you know there's people working for the police but that doesn't mean that they're really good people it just may mean that uh, they are you know just trying to survive and so that is definitely one of the things that I uh, that I would recommend about incognito Okay, well that takes care of number three. Let's get to number two. I think I think I'm gonna get killed here because I feel like I'm taking so much time, but we'll find out soon enough. So number two is BPRD. So BPRD um, is actually a comic book created by Mike Mignola, who some of you might recognize because Mike Mignola also uh, is the creator of Hellboy, and BPRD is kind of like a side. Uh, story for Hellboy, but in my opinion, it's actually a lot better, especially for a series adaptation. And the reason why, so BPRD focuses around uh, a world-ending apocalypse is basically happening. Uh, There's this plague, they call it the Plague of Frogs, where there are these frogs that are showing up, but they're like big and evil and eating people, and stuff starts to escalate from there. But the cool thing about BPRD, beside those kind of elements, which are very um, very much like Fringe, if you ever watch that, or X-Files, if you ever watch that, uh, they have a really interesting cast of characters that they follow around. So um, some of my favorites, Abe Sapien, who is an amphibious uh, amnesiac agent that they found uh, in, in like a big tube full of water way back in the day. Uh, and now he's trying to figure out what his past is. Um, does he have a connection to this thing that's happening? Things like that. So Abe Sapien's awesome. Liz Sherman, who's like a pyrokinetic that like burned down her orphanage. No, burned down her house, killed her parents, was an orphan. So she's got this really troubled past. And now she's might, she might be connected to this apocalypse. Uh, then some of my other favorites, Johann Strauss, who's like a, uh, it's like a ghost medium that got trapped outside of his body when he was like doing like a seance and then his body died and now he's just like a spirit floating around. Uh, So there's a lot of really cool characters that are going on in there. Um, Beside the fact that it's got this big kind of world ending conspiracy, which is, you know, very, uh, which is very fringe or X-Files-esque where they're investigating this and trying to dig a little bit deeper. So that's number two, BPRD. Number one is one of my favorite comics ever. It holds a special place in my heart. Uh, Mind Management, spelled Mind MGMT, like the band. Uh, This was created by Matt Kent. He actually does all the writing and drawings. He's got this beautiful watercolor style. Uh, And Mind Management is about a journalist who stumbles on a secret agency full of psychics that control the world. So she goes and she's hunting them down. So beside this fun elements of these kind of mystery box shows. Um, When I say mystery box shows, I mean something like Lost or Westworld, where, you know, it's going and it's positing all these questions. Is it going to answer them? Probably not. But the mystery is still intriguing enough that you go ahead and you watch. And guess what? When they solve one mystery, there's another one that opens up. So mind management does that really well. Uh, Now, for me personally, because I have such a hard-on for Matt Kent's art, uh, I would love if mind management was ever done, if it was done animated, because he just has some of the most beautiful comic book art that I've ever seen. Also, I'm a little biased that way. I also just like bought a board game on his uh, Kickstarter for mind management. So don't come to me if you're looking for someone that's going to give you an objective opinion on that. I am very subjective when it comes to Matt Kit. Also, I met him. Super nice guy. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. So, those are my top five indie comics to make a streaming series. Uh, So go ahead, like, and subscribe on YouTube. I'm not really sure how to end this, 
So I guess I'll just say, uh, if you disagree with me, find me. My name is Matt Holman. This has been Lunchtime Nerd. <laughs>